welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 293 of the Running Thrill podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited that you are here and excited that we have someone really special on the show today. Someone who was actually mentioned by two previous podcast guests as such a beautiful, wonderful human who I then went to stalk and look up in every way. And I absolutely loved him too and knew they were right. We had to bring him on the podcast. So today I am very excited to welcome Adam Merry to the show. Uh, Adam has been taking the, the ultra running world by storm by winning lots of uh, ultra races pretty quickly. Um, he's been setting course records. Uh, he is really thoughtful about the topics that he uh, talks about and is just a great ambassador for our sport. Like we're really lucky to have him. So I am excited to welcome Adam Mary to the show. But before we get to that, I just want to mention just a few quick things. One is to say, if you are going to be in Boston on a, in the weekend of the weekend of the Boston Marathon, I suppose, on um, Sunday, April 17th, we will be I will be hosting a together run, a live together run slash shakeout run with Tracksmith and Tommy Runs, who you may remember from a previous episode. I would love to see you there. You can go to the Tracksmith website to go sign up there. And I really hope I get to see you. I'd love to run with you the day before the race. And uh, you can be part of a Together Run. So come join us there. Secondly, just to remind you about our Together 22 meetups, which are happening every other week. These are conversations. These aren't we're kind of flipping the script on things rather than things trying to be like, here's a slideshow, here's something we want to show you, go watch it. We're actually saying these are for connection. These are for community. If you want someone to talk about the the high moments, the good things that you have had in your life, to talk about the challenges that you have had over the last few weeks, this is going to be the thing for you. Um, it is every other week. And the best way that you can go to find out more is to go to runningforreal.com and sign up for our newsletter. And I will send you links directly to go to it every other week. Okay, without any further ado, let's thank one of our sponsors and get to this episode with Adam Mary. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. Friends, I am pretty disappointed right now. I was supposed to have my inside tracker test done tomorrow. I was going to envision you, some of you holding my hand while I got my uh, blood taken because I still hate needles. I still go every three months to get my inside tracker test because I really believe in it, but I still hate needles. I was going to envision you with me and then I got bronchitis and now I'm on antibiotics and so I can't go for a few weeks and I'm honestly disappointed because I love seeing the results of my inside tracker tests it makes me <laughs> I feel you can hear it in my voice right it makes me excited to even think about seeing the results to see what things are now optimized to see what things I have to work on and give me places to improve and how to do it they give you specific foods to add to your diet specific lifestyle changes to get you to where you're body wants to be and see if you can get that ever closer to optimized while also having a life too it doesn't mean that you don't get to have a life too I've managed to optimize most of mine over the years and I still love to eat ice cream I still um, have some chips or something like that each and every day it doesn't mean that you're going to obsess over getting your body um, clean foods and healthy foods it's just going to allow you to take a look at what's on the inside as we move forward into racing season we want to see where things are at we want to be ready to go and we want to be able to adapt so that we can go for it when the time is right for us um, within our own bodies and our own schedules so thank you again to inside tracker for sponsoring this episode you my friend can get 
get 25% off by going to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina. That will get you 25% off insidetracker.com forward slash Tina. Go check it out. And then in two weeks, you can come with me uh, virtually to hold my hand as we go get our Inside Tracker test done together and we can geek out over our results together. Sound like a deal? InsideTracker.com forward slash Tina. Go check it out. Adam, I am so excited to bring you on the Running For All podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Tina. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to chat. I'm excited. Yeah, this is going to be fun. And um, I have to confess, as you probably know already from the, my reaction in the episode, it was when I was talking to um, Ryan Montgomery and Patty Gonia, uh, Win Wiley, uh, that they mentioned you and how much of an impact you had on them and how special of a human you were. And they were like, you've got to interview Adam. And I didn't know who you were, but then I geeked out on learning and oh, I wow. was like, yes, I agree. I definitely have to have this guy on the show. I think I was actually already following you at the time, but I hadn't put it together. But uh, um, either way, I have geeked out on your history and I'm just really excited for this conversation. Um, so, um, Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, fun. I have to say Ryan and Wynn are both such great people. I actually uh, met them for the first time last year in August over in Chamonix. And yep. I didn't actually know either of them. Uh, at the time. And so it was actually really like funny and kind of embarrassing. Like I met Wynn and didn't, didn't know like that, you know, who he really was on, especially on social media. And my wife was, but like, you know, who Patagonia was, I did, but like, yeah. I didn't, it didn't really come up in conversation. Yeah. And my wife was like, you met Patagonia, like what? So it was really <laughs> funny. <laughs> I would imagine that probably happens quite a lot. Um, yeah. 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 That must be a strange thing to work through because I would imagine when doesn't want to say you know oh do you know like oh when I'm patty um yes but yes yeah, I should ask them about that at some point um but thank you for sharing that I want to begin by something that it 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 jumps out to me as it often does when I come across someone who says this or or, or lives their life like this it shouldn't because we should all be living this way. But one thing I've read about you and learned about you is that joy and just having fun is the center of not only your running, but everything you do. And while that is rare to hear and sad that that's rare to hear, why, why is that a central piece in your life? And, and who instilled that in you? Or how did that get instilled in you? It's oh, kind of wow. counter. That's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I've, uh, I guess like, so as of right now, um, when we're speaking on this podcast, I am, uh, fortunate and very grateful that I run full time and I'm a coach full time. And I feel like I'm living, uh, very much in alignment with the things that I'm passionate about and that I really enjoy. But I think it's taken me a long time to get here. And, um, there was a lot of my adult life where, um, I, I maybe wasn't quite living in so much alignment and I felt, mm -hmm. uh, like trapped a little bit, you know, and it was like, there was a lot of kind of societal inertia or, um, like momentum to continue down, like the path of maybe what others expected of me or what I thought like society or others expected of me. And so it really has mm -hmm. been like, I think, um, I've been fortunate that I've had people in my life, like my wife, who is really emotionally aware and supportive, that's helped me um, lean more into the things that really do bring me joy and um, that, you know, make me smile when I do them. And uh, my coach, David Roach, has played a huge impact in that <laughs> in terms of my running specifically, but also just like not being ashamed of or um, I guess like uh, shying away from the fact that I love running and I want to talk about it. I want to learn about it and I want to do it all the mm -hmm. time. And that's okay. That's great. So mm -hmm. I think it's just been a process for me to really embrace that living in alignment and living joyfully is a, uh, is a good thing, even if it's a little non-traditional. Yeah, which is, is just, as I said, crazy to say when you think about it that way. Okay. So you said it was there, you said it was a, it's been a process. What, what what are some of the key moments that that prompted that journey? Because I feel like I'm very much on the same 
path. And um, I mentioned to you that I have bronchitis right now. Mm. And I think a lot of the reason for that was because I got suckered into the old me that was saying, stop being soft, get on with it. Like Mm. just get, and that pulls me away from joy because that pulls me away from running being something I want to do to something I have to do and all these things being have to do's. So I feel like I'm on that journey, but you're still kind of like a two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. So tell us some of the pivotal moments for you that have been kind of, I guess, forks in the road. Yeah. Well, I think, I don't know why this one comes to mind, but, um, you know, my, I have a younger sister, she's two years younger than I am. And she is just finishing um, a veterinary like degree. So she's going to be a full-blown veterinary doctor here um, this year. But it's taken her all of her 20s to achieve that, you know, very long path. And I remember um, maybe like four or five years ago while I was working at my nonprofit job that I worked for seven years, uh, I was kind of talking to her and just saying, yeah, I'm like, the job's going great. I got promoted. like." it's, you know, by all assessments is going really well, but I don't know. I'm like, I'm kind of stuck or I'm not very happy. And she, I remember she kind of just said something like, well, why don't you just do the thing that like you really want to be doing? And like, you're not getting any younger and, um, yeah, you should like do what really makes you happy and what, um, follow your dreams now. Cause you're not getting any younger. So I don't know why, like that moment kind of mm-hmm. sticks out. And then I think the, maybe the biggest moment was when I, um, it was actually during COVID, like right at the beginning of 2020. And my wife and I had always kind of thought about moving to Colorado, but because of my very stable job in Monterey, California, my family was there. Um, and a lot of other like life factors, it was like, Oh, well, we'll probably just live here for a very long time. And, um, she asked me this question that's always, that was really striking at the time. And I still think is really cool. She said, Hey, like if we live the rest of our lives and never move to Colorado, never live in Colorado, are you going to be okay with that? And I was like, no, definitely not. And I knew that like immediate gut reaction. And so it really was clarifying in the sense of like, oh, well, I guess that means I need to quit my job or figure out how to work remotely and we're going to move there now. And so I think with other decisions in my running life, I've kind of used that same framework of like, hey, if I just think about this, am I okay with like never doing this? And if the answer is like a resounding, no, I really want to do it, then I try to figure Mm -hmm. out how to make it happen within reason as soon as possible. I love that. And I think I I actually quite often find myself thinking like, oh, next time I'll do this. And I'm like, wait, 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 there isn't a next time. (laughs) Like (laughs) this is one time, one shot you have. Um, Yeah. And I think it's easy to get into that mindset of like later, later, later. But as you said, yeah, uh, if if the answer is uh, like, am I prepared to not have this forever? Like, should you act on it? Yes. I got to ask you that related to that, just on a selfish note, as I know yeah. you are passionate environmentally too. Yes. With me, a lot of the, the kind of weighing here is like, do I really, really, really want to go to like most countries of the world? Yes, I do. Yeah. Do I really want to put the uh, carbon footprint of all those mm. countries train, uh, flights on my conscience? Oh, no, I do not. So how do you weigh that stuff? Mm, that's a great, um, a great point, a great question. I think it's, a uh, something really like, I think an individual kind of choice for most of us, you know, who live, especially in the, you know, like the States here, like there, we have a lot of, um, generally speaking, like privilege of mobility, you know, yeah. we can, whether it's on public transportation or buying a plane ticket that's relatively inexpensive, traveling within the country very easily, mm-hmm. um, and even traveling abroad like is you know fairly attainable. Um, but I don't know, you know, I've met folks that have a very, um, uh, I would say, like maybe more on the extreme end of an ideological motivation to not travel at all even outside mm. of the state, you know, John Rea comes to mind of, and it's, it's laudable. Like 
he exhausted the entire Colorado racing scene before he traveled outside of Colorado to race at Bandera uh, to compete for a golden ticket this year. And he got one really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's other people on the other end of the spectrum that are traveling all the time internationally just for pleasure. And that's, you know, that's cool too. I think one thing that I um, saw a little bit, so just to be transparent, like I worked uh, at a, in a a nonprofit um, aquarium conservation organization in Monterey. And I was a multimedia at the Monterey at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Yes, I've been there. That was. Oh. I wonder if you were there when I was there. Good. That's cool. Well, I worked there for seven years, so I might have been. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I was a, a multimedia engineering um, professional, and I led the team that built the multimedia experiences for the visitors down at the aquarium. So that was my specialization. I'm not a scientist or a trained like climate scientist or anything like that or a marine biologist, but I did get to work with a lot of those people. And a lot of the things that I saw, um, up close was that, Hey, like, yes, for example, um, banning plastic straws or not using plastic straws or bringing a plastic bag to, or a a reusable bag to the grocery store instead of using a plastic bag is great. And you should do that. And the biggest and most impactful changes that the aquarium spent its resources toward was lobbying for policy changes in Washington. And mm-hmm. so as a, an individual, like now, um, you making sure that I exercise my right to vote at the local, uh, you know, state and then, uh, national level is like the, I think probably the most impactful yeah. choice I can make to make sure that we as a country, we have a big carbon footprint and an impact as a country um, kind of start to steer ourselves in a more, um, uh, mm-hmm. a better direction. I was going to say sustainable, but yeah, like a better, um, direction from a, you know, climate, uh, change standpoint. Um, yeah. but yeah, in terms of my own personal choices, I, uh, I guess maybe from where I stand, like I try to balance my travel with like, is it a really great opportunity? Is it, a? it maybe, is there, a additional things that I plan to do Yes. at the place that I'm going and is there family there? There are other things like that that are motivating the trip instead of just, well, I'm just going there to run a race and then flying back. Yeah. Yeah. I do the same thing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And, and thanks to the listeners uh, for going off on a tangent for a minute there, as I often <laughs> do with sustainability. Um, now I know that you have a close relationship with your mom who started running in her sixties, which I loved hearing. And actually my mom started running yes. last year as well in her sixties. So oh, I, I awesome. know how much that means. Heck um, yeah. But uh, tell us a little bit about that relationship and how cool is that, that you get to go to races together and um, just get to, yeah, be a part of that shared experience. Uh, it's so cool. Well, so it's funny, like my mom, um, I don't think she'd mind me sharing. She's fairly short, um, but she was a sprinter in Mm. high school. So she, you know, did a little bit of track and field um, growing up, but then never really got into like jogging when that was in, you know, in, (laughs) Um, and then, yeah, never did any endurance or distance activities. And so it's just, it's been really cool because as I have gotten more into trail running in the last six or so years, Mm -hmm. she, um, got a lot more into walking outside, um, and then walk doing, you know, trail hikes, but she's got these short legs, but she like has a really fast cadence and she, she can really move. And so she, um, a couple years ago signed up for her first trail race as a 25 K with like, you know, 2000 feet of vertical gain, really proper race. And, um, and she did it and it was so, um, I guess moving for me as her son to, I didn't like really encourage her to do it. She just wanted to do it on her own. And yeah, like I actually, uh, haven't had the chance to run a race with her, like both experience mm. the same course on the same day, okay. but, but I really want to, and I look forward to it. You know, I'm actually, I'm also a running coach and I still haven't, I coach my dad, but she is still working and hasn't come around, like won't let me really help her too much, but, um, she has a ton of potential and it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm inspired by her, I think probably more than she knows and more than uh, she's inspired by me, I think. That's so cool. What a, what a amazing thing to experience and see that transformation in her. That's, um, that's really special. And I love that you said, so your dad runs too? 
Yeah. Yeah. So oh, he's, he, he's a little bit older, but he, um, he does, uh, you know, hiking and biking and running as well. So I'm kind of coaching him in a general fitness and multi-sport capacity, but yeah, no, he gets after it too. They, so they do trail races together often, oh, now, which cool. is really special and cool to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Now, I want to go into something else from your past, which is um, I did read on a um, article. I actually have to think about what that article was was for to give them some credit. But um, you, um, I think it was Run Spirited. Is oh, that, yes. Is that right? Henry Run Howard, yeah. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to that. But it said that you um, you learned a lot from doing football in college that you apply to your running which is not something we typically hear. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, you know, so just in case you have any international listeners, we're talking about American football here. So (laughs) yeah, I uh, I know it's so funny, but yeah, you know, I played football um, in high school and college and it was, uh, yes, I played a lot of different sports, you know, baseball, I ran track and field as well. Um, Growing up, played soccer. So um I really think that like being part of teams growing up, um, just like throughout my whole childhood and then into my teenage and early twenties really like, um, teach it taught me a lot. And I think it teaches people a lot, um, on how to like, you know, show up and be strong, not just for yourself in a game or at practice, but like for your teammates, Mm -hmm. especially in football, like you have a, uh, a job to do like a responsibility out there on the field, uh, in your position. And if you don't do that job, like other people can get hurt or they, you know, you fail the play, you don't catch the ball or whatever. So it really, um, I think I learned a lot of like, um, I don't know, like res- personal responsibility and trying to prepare as well as I can, like before the game day or race, um, so that m- my whole team would succeed. And, uh, yeah, one thing I learned that maybe like, has impacted me the most positively is that I was the captain of my football team, um, senior year of high school. And we went one and nine, which means Mm we won one game and lost Mm -hmm. nine. That's that's a really bad record, (laughs) but it taught me a lot. And, um, yeah, just seeing that whole team of, uh, young men, like, uh, go through that season together and me trying to um, lead them through that and also deal with it myself, um, taught me how to lose and how to remain optimistic and positive and kind of let those, you know, moments, especially in trail running or, you know, just training at a high level when maybe the outcome you get doesn't line up with what you were hoping was going to happen or with what your training might've indicated, um, as just being part of the process and like, Mm -hmm not, uh, not really letting it totally wreck me emotionally or anything. I I kind of can get over those things pretty quickly and move on. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that about, yeah. I mean, I guess that could apply to any other sport, right. Of, of practicing losing essentially, um, and how that could translate to, yeah, things going wrong in running because they do, uh, often. (laughs) Um, and so I really appreciate you sharing that. So how did running come into the picture? Yeah, well, I always um, just like throughout my childhood loved like being active and moving fast. Um, Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it was like with a skateboard or on a snowboard or um, in sports. I always liked to play the positions where you were running. Um, Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think it's just kind of in my DNA. But I came around to it um, after college, uh, maybe like most folks do. Like I just had a friend who had run the Boston marathon a few times and had done some trail races and kind of just was like, Hey, like, would you, do you want to like join me for a trail run? You want to go for a trail run? And I was like, I didn't, I didn't even like know what that was, you know? (laughs) So, um, it was really funny because I remember still like showing up to his apartment with like basketball shorts and like super old Nike freeze. These like really, you know, they were like running shoes, but they were very old and, didn't have any water, didn't have any snacks. And uh, that was how I got my first introduction to trail running was just showing up there. And, but honestly, kind of having a really memorable experience in the woods um, with him, like get going on all these different trails and just seeing the place that I grew up 
in it from a different lens and like, mm. yeah, just recognizing that, oh, wow, there's all these trails right here that I w- didn't even know were in my community. And um, yeah, that was really impactful. And I was kind of hooked at that moment. So it was, it was kind of immediate from that run. You were like, I want to do this again. Yeah. Yeah. And even though it, he said it was going to be four miles and it ended up being eight miles. Uh, so, and, you know, I was kind of like unprepared. It was really fun. And yeah, like I think it was probably four months after that or something, I did my first trail race, which was a 50K. So it, and that really like showed me the whole kind of mm. um, awesome community and the, I got the whole experience of when you really run an ultra distance, like yeah, the highs and lows of that um, mm. were, yeah, definitely kind of uh, motivating and inspiring. Well, I'm about to discover that in a few months, I hope. Oh, <laughs> what, are you, yeah, what are you running? Um, the listeners are probably bored of me bringing this up at this point. Um, <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> because I keep, it, I keep speaking to ultra athletes. And so I, they're always like, oh, you're doing your first 50K soon. Um, yeah. I'm doing the Bryce Canyon, which is a very nice. like Tory kind of let's, I, but for that reason, I wanted to keep it fun. Um, yes. because I come from like an elite running road racing background. I want to yes. stay, steer it as far away from that as I could. So yeah, I'm, uh, that's in uh, end of May. So I'm quite excited to, to give that a go. So hopefully I will see what you're talking about, but I obviously know the running community in general and how supportive they are. And, um, and why start with a 50 K then? Well, well for me, like at that time I was just so inexperienced that I didn't really (laughs) know that I could do a trail race that was shorter than that. (laughs) If I did, I might've chosen that, but, um, yeah, I think, and my friend was kind of like, Oh yeah, like you, you should sign up for a 50 K. I did this one last year. Do you want to do it with me this year? It'll be super fun. It's, and you know, he was downplaying it. He's like, Oh, it's not even going to be that hard. And, <laughs> and when you've never done that, I thought I was mm. thinking to myself, Oh, I've run a, I've run a half marathon on the road. It's only twice the distance. And then a little bit more, like how hard could it be? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it, it's a lot harder <laughs> it, yeah. it turns out, but, um, yeah, no, it was, uh, I, that was really why just, I didn't really know that, Oh, I could run a trail 25 K or I could run a trail 10 K and it's still mm-hmm. a similar experience. So now what I, you know, tell my athletes and what I try to kind of preach to everyone is like, what's so special about trail running is not really running 50 K or 50 miles or a hundred mm-hmm. miles. It's like the community that comes mm-hmm. together in this really beautiful state park or, you know, beautiful location and celebrates the act of moving in nature together and then celebrating everyone's accomplishment at the end. And the camaraderie that kind of uh, comes from all of that is the special part. It's not so much how far you run. Thank you to All Birds for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. I am loving my All Birds items that I have been using. And guess what, friends? They now have the Tree Dasher 2 out and available, and people are loving it. The Tree Dasher comes in these really cool colors. I have the Rad Rust. I love that name, by the way. Um, and the tree dashes are these new and improved versions of the original dashes, um, which has is lighter, has a more responsive foam, it's got extra grip, improved fit, it's going to keep you running, going to keep you exploring. I wear it all day, every day. I am almost always wearing those shoes if you will see me around. They have um, a no slip heel fit, which is going to give you that improved heel collar, so it's going to lock your ankle in place. And it is made by Allbirds, who has a goal of making, of do everything we do, doing it better. And they are doing a fantastic job, can I just say. Um, I'm really loving being a part of this community. And these shoes are incredibly comfortable. I cannot tell you how many hours I have put on my original Dashers and now I'm beginning to put on my Dasher 2s. They have so many hours on them. They are made with sustainable materials and Allbirds is just doing all they can to just care for our community. And guess what, actually? Good point. As I mentioned, I've been wearing them so much. They are machine washable. They're not going to lose their shape. The shoes go right in the wash. You can wash them as much as you like. And um, they've been handling it pretty well in my 
in my washing machine. Um, finally, one more thing I want to mention. Allbirds is a carbon neutral company thanks to sustainable practices they use and using more natural materials and funding other high impact carbon projects. Um, but the, this shoe is bringing their carbon footprint down on this shoe yet again. They're on a constant journey and um, have a goal of getting to zero. Um, but until they are able to do that, it is really cool to see the number coming down each time. So go to allbirds.com to go check out more. There is no code right now. I just want you to go check it out for yourself. Go to allbirds.com to check out more. And the camaraderie that kind of uh, comes from all of that is the special part. It's not so much how far you run. Mm, that's beautifully said. Thank you. Was that apparent to you from that race in, in terms of even though I'm assuming that was quite painful, you continued on immediately like, I, I got to do this again? Yes. Yeah, because I guess, um, you know, I had run. So I grew up in Monterey, California. So that's where I was living at the time. So I had run the Monterey Bay Half Marathon, which is a road race, beautiful mm -hmm. along the Monterey Peninsula. Highly recommend uh, people do it. Um, so that was my first half marathon and my first, uh, 50 K that we were just talking about was in the Santa Cruz mountains. It's called the Woodside trail run. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being so struck at the difference at the finish line. Like, I guess I had a lot more conversation with the other people who had run that race and finished at a similar time around me, the race director I talked with, and they were congratulating me and asking me about my day. And I think that was just a lot different than any road race I had done, which is like, you know, you finish and there you go kind of situation and maybe you go ring the PR bell. But, um, yeah, like I guess just, it's a much, it felt like a more intimate, um, laid back vibe and there's like beers at the finish line and some guy like barbecuing and asking you what you want. So I don't know. It was like, it was my style. So I really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. You have been quite outspoken and talked a lot about, um, you know, bringing more inclusivity into trail run well, into running in general, but particularly mm -hmm. into trail running, into ultra running. Um, and as a person of color, this is for obvious reasons, something that you want to speak out about, but with re yes. regards to that, was that something pretty apparent to you in those early days as well that, you know, I'm, this is uh, everyone around me is white and, and, you know, I need, we need to see more people who, um, are diverse and have different personalities and, um, you know, bringing everyone in. Was that pretty apparent at the beginning? Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Like I've, I've actually like not really been asked that question before, but when I think about it now, you know, at the, at the time when I ran my first 50 K, like, I think I was so overwhelmed by all of the new stuff that I was experiencing mm -hmm. and just like, being so nervous about running that far and like getting through it and all of that, that I was not really like noticing that around me at the time. And I just felt like, wow, this is like a really fringe thing. Like there's not even that many people out here anyway, but <laughs> certainly like the more I did it, um, the more races I did. And, um, I've done many tens of trail races now. Um, I started to notice it more and, um, yeah, it's, it's been, um, it's been interesting, you know, like I, you know, so I, for the listeners, I'm half black and half white. So it's, it's funny, like, I feel there's this kind of um, duality to my identity, you know, um, and I've grown up my whole life, kind of code switching and mm -hmm. just, uh, yeah, like I can relate kind of to both communities. And so at the time, like, it just was like, yeah, like, wow, this is just like a bunch of fringe people like running into the woods. And I guess I'm maybe <laughs> joining this club. This is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, the more I did it, like, and once I got more um, serious, serious about training and uh, had a couple wins and stuff like that, like, I kind of noticed, uh, I, I had I never shared, I've never shared a podium with another black man or runner in general. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of started to become more apparent, like, Oh man, like there are like no brothers at the front of these races. Like, and I remember distinctly when I got, when the first time I raced with Corey Woltering, it was like, Whoa, like <laughs> I'm getting to race and share miles at the beginning of this race with this other yeah. black guy. This is so cool. And yeah. we had some conversation during the race and like, 
it was great. But yeah, that's only happened like once, you know, so it is um, something I noticed for sure. Yeah. And uh, it, it's interesting you say that because I've asked a version of that question to quite a few people in the community who, uh, you know, the, are, are passionate and, and talk about this a lot. And they've all given a similar answer in the I mean, a part of it is obviously um, as a person of color, you're used to surrounding yourself, walking into a room and being the only the only person of color or like, you know, being in situation where the underrepresented groups or and communities are just not there. Like, so maybe it's a part of that. Yes. But every person I've asked a version of that to has said the similar thing of like the beginning. I really didn't notice. And I think you're right. It's the the stimulation like there's so much going on um that yep. you just kind of are taking it all in and as you said i mean you said fringe people but i'd say like trail runners and runners in general maybe a bit on the strange side compared yeah. to um, <laughs> people who do other sports so yes. we all have our own like funky personalities as it is but um totally. yeah as you said you 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 become more aware of it and especially in trail running i mean i think it's it's changing now, but I think especially, you know, when I think five, ten years ago, when you thought of a, a male trail runner, they, it was they weren't all just white. They looked the same. A certain like, same way. style of yeah. facial hair, same <laughs> hair, same body type. Like it was like uh, just like clones of, of each other. Um and so it's things yes. are changing now, but I that I was assuming would also be part of it that it was quite striking that everyone is like, is that the same person who won that race? Was it? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, but thank you for sharing that. And, um, you mentioned about running with Corey, who is also a previous co uh, podcast guest on here. Yes. Um, and, um, I've also seen you write about how much you enjoy and love, um, running with like competing against people, but also, um, the beauty of that, that you are competing, but you're also working together. And I've seen you say about like intensity and, and this yes. dynamic um, racing sport uh, that we have. So yeah, talk a little bit about that. Cause I, that was something that really um, fascinated me reading about you. Yeah. Well, so I think it's part of what really drew me and draws me to trail running today. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's this really cool, I don't know if it's a phenomenon, but like a unique characteristic where we all train hard for these events, you know, and whether it's like your first 50 K and you're training to, to try and accomplish it, or it's your 50th 50 K and you're, you know, just out there, maybe you're trying to win. Maybe you're just trying to get your 50th finish, right? Like we all put a lot of work and effort into this, this sport. And so it's this funny thing where like a bunch of elite men or women line up and there's like, no, at least I've never experienced it. There's no like bad blood or like kind of person to person, like mm, competition and like, uh, in the same way that there might be in other sports where there's trash talking or anything like that. It's, it's almost like we're all, uh, it's, I heard this actually said by Francois Dane, who's a famous ultra runner. He's like, by the time you show up to the starting line, like who is going to win is like basically kind of already decided. And so it's just like, we're all just going to see what kind of a day we have out there. And like, there's no real point in like playing games with each other on the course or like talking trash, like the, whoever is the most fit is going to win. And so I feel like there's something really beautiful about that because whenever you're racing with other people, there's always this like camaraderie or positivity and chatting that's going on. Um, that's, I don't know. I feel like very unique. I did some road cycling racing in the past and there, that was never part of part of the sport at all. So I really enjoy that. It's almost like we're all out there um, testing ourselves against the course together and we all kind of root for each other, um, even though obviously we all want to have our best day and hopefully be victorious. But um, yeah, it's this really cool camaraderie. And you felt that on the roads as well? I did not. I did not find that on the roads. Yeah, I, I did not. Say, yeah, in the world I come from, I, I didn't no, have that experience so much. No. And so that's, I think, why I was drawn to trail running so much is because it felt like a, a bunch of people hanging out that all like each other and celebrate each other at the finish line and get excited about what everyone else is doing. Um, and then, yeah, when you're racing each other, it's kind of just like, 
dang, yeah, if you're like more fit than I am, like I'm not going to be able to keep up with you. It's all good. You know, like, yeah. And and obviously there is some still like racing dynamics. That's very fun. Like um, I raced recently the Moab Red Hot 33K with a guy, Josh Eberly. He's a really talented runner. And we had some like back and forth. Like I passed him really aggressively. Then he caught me and did the same thing. And we did that a couple of times, but it's still all like hugs and smiles and like good vibes at the finish. So yeah, I, I do like that that still exists, that kind of higher intensity dynamic um, on the race course for sure. So I have to ask for, for the listeners who, who are just like, oh, I wonder. So when this was happening with you and Josh going back and forth, yes. when you're passing him, what's going through your mind? Um, well, so when it's going through my mind is like, I know, you know, so this is another cool part about the sport. Like I know Josh, I know of him, you know, and I've raced him before and I know how good he is. I know how, um, you know, like, uh, tactical and strategic a racer he is. And so when I pass him, I'm thinking like, it's a downhill. I'm a really downhill is my strength. And so I wanted to pass him, um, assertively and, um, I didn't say anything. I just passed him and just like tried to put a gap on him. Um, and he caught me on a climb and I think he made some kind of comment like, Oh, we're almost there, you know, kind of a nice thing. And, um, but yeah, there's certainly like, um, yeah, we're both like testing each other a little bit, but it's not, um, it wasn't a bad intention or anything or no bad vibes. And I remember when I finally got him was like, I just kind of dropped it on a downhill and, and lost him there. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, I'm not really thinking about much other than just, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people think about this. Like when you make a move, like you want it to look convincing and want the other yeah. racer to think, Oh shoot, I can't hang with that. <laughs> Thank you to the Boulderthon for sponsoring this episode of the Running Thrill podcast. What is the Boulderthon, you ask? Well, on October 9th, 2022, yep, that is a few months away from now, there will be the second annual Boulderthon, which has a full marathon, a half marathon, a 10K, and a kids' run. And it is run in one of the happiest cities in America. You are going to run at the foothills of the Rockies and join the Boulder community. Yes, that community where so many of the runners we love and look up to live. You never know, you might run into one of them while you're warming up. This community, Boulder, is one of the greatest meccas in the US. That is why so many professional and running focused people have flock there, live there. Honestly, I would live there if I could. I'm not kidding. I really would love to live there. It is an amazing place to be. And for the first time in history, they have an epic downtown Boulder finish. How cool is that? Can I actually come with you if you decide to sign up for this race? It just sounds a lot of fun. Um, and Boulderthon is sure to be an incredible event um, just from what I am seeing here right now. You can check out their website uh, by going to Boulderthon dot org that's b o u l d e r t h o n dot org boulderthon dot org and if you use code tina you can get twenty dollars off the full or half marathon so that's code tina that will get you twenty dollars off the full or the half marathon and friends it's we've been trapped inside for so long let's go enjoy some of these races that the country that the us has to offer there are so many fun things to be doing and this boulderthon is added to my list for sure to be one to be doing maybe you will even see me there who knows i may end up signing up go to boulderthon.org to check out more information and go do that race october 9th 2022 <music> Yes, yes. And and I wasn't saying that to put any bad stuff, but as you said, no, it, no, it's no. always like, you know, appreciating competition. Yes. And, um, you know, I've had plenty of experiences where I was like kind of doing this thing. But um, to be honest, when I, you know, I'd like to think I've matured since like 2012 to 2015. Yes, <laughs> but yes. um, a lot of the time when I would pass someone, it would be very much like, I got you now. I'm going to, mm. <laughs> whereas like, you know, um, I love that maybe it's the ultra world. Maybe it's the fact that you kind of know of him or maybe it's just you, but you, you're able to see it in very much like a, about me, like what can I do rather than a, like, I'm going to get you making it about the other person. So I think that's oh. beautiful that you said that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like well, me, I think it was selfish, like, ha ha, I'm passing you. Oh, and that's there is, like, yeah. you're seeing it as like a, I'm strong. I'm going to go, you can do what you want. 
Yes. You know? Well, that is interesting. I mean, I definitely have nowhere near the kind of um, road experience that you do, but yeah, to me, it has always felt like um, me, like a uh, internally focused and centric. And if I just, and Oh, one thing, this is something my coach has always told me before races, my coach, David Roach, he says like smile as much as you can and try to be as uplifting to others as possible because you, yeah. it comes back to you, you know, yeah. like, so yeah. I feel like when you encourage other runners, uh, even people that you're racing directly, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a flex, you know, it's like, great job, you know, like we got this and it's uplifting for them. Yeah. And it's almost, I think like more a sign of strength to try yeah. to uplift others. Yeah. And then yeah, that so kind of comes back to you because maybe they say great job to you and that makes you feel good. And so I've always found uh, power in that as opposed to maybe trying to push others down as I'm racing. I love hearing that. And I love that this has officially confirmed me as like an asshole here. No, no, no. I, me. It's no, okay. It's no. okay. I've come to peace with that. I wasn't, maybe wasn't. I have a joke within my community that I have what I call airport Tina, who like pushes people out the way to get the front oh, of the line. Okay. So she was in full force back then. But like I said, I hope I've matured. So wow. I, I know I wouldn't do that now. Like I'm very much in a different mindset and I, it, absolutely resonate with everything you're saying. So, um, awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but thank you. I want to read to you, read back to you, if you don't mind, uh, a part of sure. a quote that I saw on, I think it was one of your Instagram posts, but I thought it was so beautiful and such a, I'd never thought about our sport in this way, but it's so true. And I'd love to hear you just expand on it. So okay. you said, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> and maybe it's the fact that you use an owl emoji and my daughter is obsessed with owls that oh, it caught my attention I but love it. it says this sport is like a tarot oh um, i don't even know how to say the word is it tarot card tarot, tarot. card tarot yeah. this sport is like a tarot card reading there are no bad cards everything has a me everything has meaning and if you reflect and ask the right questions you'll deepen your understanding of yourself and the world around you that is yes. profound my friend <laughs> please expand on that Oh man. Well, I think that was what I wrote after the Bandera hundred K this year, um, which was a disappointing result for me. Like I had put a lot of effort uh, in training and thought and preparation into that race and ended up uh, not having the day I was hoping for. Um, but you know, it was so funny. Like, so my, um, my wife is in, into Oracle cards and tarot cards, uh, which are, these like decks of cards and each card has a meaning, but then all the cards like put together have like a collective meaning. And so the way it works is you like ask a question, right? So like, uh, you know, it could be as simple as like, should I race the Bryce Canyon 50 K, you know, and then you like pull over three or pull out three cards from this big deck and then you, you flip them over and they all have a meaning. And so I it think sounds like, like an eight ball. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of is like a, a complex eight ball, you know, with kind of a, okay. some cool, like, yeah, mystical um, energy around it. But I think like, what I was getting at with that is basically like, you know, you, especially with ultra running, when there's so many variables, and you're out there for so long. Um, it's just, you'd kind of do like, never know what you're going to get. And if you like, I've been asked before, like, Oh, can you tell me about like a failure you've had racing or something like that? And like, I really don't view any of the races that, you know, haven't gone my way as a failure. It's really like a learning opportunity or, um, a chance for me to like get, get really raw with myself and like experience that on the day. And like, what areas do I maybe have to work on or, Oh, maybe did I neglect this part of my mental game or not? Or as in the case of Bandera, like that's just what happened today. I mean, like I, it turns out like had some kind of like viral stomach thing going on that I didn't know at the time, but it's just like, just didn't have a, didn't have a good day. And that happened. And so I think like for me, like reflecting after that race with my wife and my close friends, like, I drew a lot of meaning out of that race and it was, you know, there's no bad, there's no bad that came of it. I mean, like, yes, it would have been nice to get a golden ticket to go to Western States, but 
you know, perhaps I've learned more about myself and stand to grow in the long mm -hmm. term as a human mm -hmm. and an ultra runner more so by experiencing that tough day out there. And so, yeah, that's kind of what I, what I meant is just like, if you approach every experience with like a curious mind and, um, yeah, just looking to learn, then there, you're setting yourself up for success regardless of the outcome. Yes. I love that. And I agree with it so much. I mean, people often say to me, would you go back and change something if you like, da, 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 if you could? And I'm like, yes, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because I, I, I mean, it's not like the butterfly effect from the, the movie, uh, mm. but like, I really believe that things, when things don't come together for us, it just wasn't the right time. Like you said about Western States, maybe you'd have gone to Western States and you'd have tripped and broken your leg. Like <laughs> totally. so the world is preventing you from that happening. Like, yes. um, you know, uh, it, uh, yeah. So I very much feel the same way and, and it can be tough to shift your mindset towards that. Um, maybe if someone's had like a family member who is very, um, very much sees things in black and white and, and, uh, mm. this is a failure. This is a success. This is an, or maybe it's just, um, they've had really tough things happen again and again. And they, and the, the, not the silver lining, but the bright light hasn't shown itself yet. And so they're having, yes. a, do you have any advice for someone who is hearing you and I maybe talk about this and saying, well, it's all well and good you saying that, Mm. but things seem to generally unfold in your path. Like, okay, you didn't, you didn't win that race, but you still finished further up than I ever could finish. Um, mm. what would you say to that person? Jeez. Yeah. Well, I would say I hear you. And I think a lot of those same thoughts too. And so like, you know, that's a real, uh, real take and a real experience. Uh, and I would also say I didn't finish that race. I, I dropped out. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, just to like, be, you know, keep it real because like yeah. I, um, yeah, I was wrecked and I'd been walking and like, um, yeah, it just was not my day. But I think what I would say is like, um, you know, one thing that you know actually happened very recently is I think it's important in life to like, hopefully surround yourself with people or at least one person that can, that you trust and respect and can like, you know, reflect your own emotions and feelings back to you as you're processing them. And so, you know, for me, like I, I would relate to a person, um, with that kind of like black and white, um, I guess for success metric and framework of like, if I win, it's a success. If I don't, it's a failure. If I finish, it's a success. If I don't, it's a failure. And some of that is cultural, but you know, I, I was actually, <laughs> I'll share this. I think it's good. I was just talking with my therapist about this today. And so it's a very fresh, uh, fresh take, but you know, as you mentioned, Tina, I'm a, uh, person of color, right. I'm, I'm half black and half white, you know, and I, um, oftentimes like regardless of my racial identity, just because of who I am as a person and a competitor, I want to win, mm -hmm. you know, like I train to win. I put a lot of effort into it and it's just, I really want to achieve like those kinds of results. My therapist who happens to be a black man, a previous collegiate athlete and a coach now. So he's like got a lot of overlapping life experience. He told me, Adam, like you being at this race is a win for us. You like being there on the starting line with your kinked hair and darker skin, like that is a win. So like just hearing that and being reminded of like, oh yeah, there's all these other things about me being here that is a win that I, that are maybe like not so black and white of like finishing or not, or winning or not. Um, I think it's really important and it, it goes far beyond race. Like there's so many other like intersectional experiences and, you know, parts about who we are as people that, you know, like our journeys kind of, um, there's just so much more to each of our journeys that like represents a win or represents success. And so yeah. I just, I don't know. I've, it, I would say to that person like, Hey, I get reminded of it on a daily basis. And it's just a process of kind of like checking in with that emotion and then hopefully having someone that can help you process it and reflect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate 
I appreciate that and, and the vulnerability you shared in doing so. If you don't mind me asking related to that, is that something you do feel pressure that because you are one of few people of color out on the trail course that you feel you got to represent well? I've um, You mentioned mm. Corey al- earlier. Yeah, yeah. Corey has talked about this specifically or he, as he says, he's more passionate about um, uh, getting more um, Midwesterners to be trail yeah. runners than he the is. Cornfield Cowboys, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, he, his team... Uh, for uh, the amazing race, which I did a whole se- uh, series on, um, they talked about, and I can't remember if it was him that said it or one of his teammates, about feeling like we're out here um, with the first team of um, African American, um, uh, four African American competitors or something. Yes. We want to represent well. Like, do you feel that pressure? Is that why that was in conversation with your therapist? Yeah. It's so. It's interesting. I I think like it's different for every person, like certainly yeah. every person of color. And I can only speak from my own experience, but yes. for me, like the way it, oh, and just to acknowledge for listeners too, like, you know, I do have some, uh, some degree of like skin privilege. Like I'm so, mm-hmm. I'm a slightly lighter skinned multiracial person. Even my sister, same mom and dad, like just happens to have darker skin. So, um, yeah, I think that maybe affects my perspective, but um, for me, like the, it, I don't feel, I do not feel pressure. I feel, um, I guess like that part of who I am and my identity and wanting to represent is like an additional wind in my sails. So okay. if I'm like having trouble getting out for a, t- for a training day, that's something that can just push it over the edge of like, no, I'm going to do that harder route or no, I'm going to go do the run. Um, but on race day, I don't feel that pressure at all. I think I, I have much more of just like an athlete experience of like, just wanting to perform. It's, I don't feel like a pressure or weight of, of the race racial thing. Okay. So the talk of the therapist this morning was, was more to do with just as a like gritty athlete who works hard wanting to win for that reason. Yes. Yes. And I don't, yeah, I don't experience like yeah. Negative pressure. Um, I don't think, but he, he was reminding me that like, yeah, like rep part of the representing it, you know, it's like the whole journey that's, mm-hmm. that takes many years to unfold. Like it does for all of us, like building endurance fitness takes years, you know? And so, um, just letting that unfold and celebrating all of the little milestones along the way and touching, touching other people in the community, like physically on the course and then like metaphorically, is what it's all about. And so I think it's just important to be reminded of that. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. So in December 21, you signed with Socony. I'd love for you to share about, was that a surprise? Was that something that really helped you to, to solidify what you felt was your place in the community? Or did you not really, I mean, obviously the financial support is appreciated, but how did that, um, decision, I suppose, um, impacts, yeah, your own perspective on your racing. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it was, it was certainly like a surprise, um, at how it all came about. Like they Mm -hmm. reached out to me, uh, in the summer of last year. And so we had like kind of conversations over many months. So by the time it actually happened, it wasn't a surprise, but certainly like, um, the way it kind of started was a surprise. I, um, yeah, it's funny. Like when I first started in the sport, like I didn't think, I guess I wasn't even really aware that like being a professional trail runner was like a thing at all. Um, (laughs) and then the more I did it, it was like, yeah, but like, that's not even like an aspiration like that I could control or that I, I wasn't even aspiring to that. It was more like, man, like, I wonder if I can run a sub four hour 50 K or, Oh, I wonder if, maybe I can win this local race or something, but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I really was surprised and, uh, appreciate, I have appreciated, um, like the way that they have supported me and the, obviously I feel very like honored and uh, humbled to be on the team with Katie Asmuth and, um, Grayson Murphy, like two very talented female trail runners. And, um, yeah, I, you know, to be honest, like it, it validated, um, me a little bit, like, I guess it, to be honest, like as an elite athlete, it was like, Oh, cool. Like, wow. Like mm-hmm. that's, that's cool. Like I'm 
sponsored in it, you know, everyone knows like it shoe costs add up, you know, over time. <laughs> like it's really nice to have that support. Um, but I, um, I do feel like surprisingly, like I did think maybe that having a sponsorship would, um, fulfill me more than mm-hmm. like, you know, make me feel like, Oh, I made it, but mm-hmm. it, it didn't. And it made me realize, which I guess I think is a good thing. Like the things that, um, are really like intrinsically motivating and satisfying that I'm shooting for are like the things that I like the races that I want to run and the results that I want to try and get. And having Saucony as a sponsor and a supporter, like helps me do those things, but it's not like, that's the apex or the pinnacle of what I'm aspiring to do at all. Um, yeah. and the impact I want to have in the sport, like, uh, from a cultural standpoint is like buoyed by Saucony's support and they get, uh, lend me their platform to amplify my voice. But you know, it's what I say. It's not just like being a Saucony athlete yes. that, that, uh, is important. And so, yeah, I, I'm super grateful to be part of that team and community. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I, uh, I think it's like maybe a yes and no type of answer. <laughs> I think that means you've got a really good perspective and grip on on your relationship to the sport, and I, I mean, I think that's amazing. Honestly, um, that that hasn't that that you have that perspective. So thank you for that, Thanks. and um, that's really cool. You mentioned that you are a coach. Do you want to share with us a little bit about who you know, what kind of runners you coach, and just yeah, yeah anything else you want to share? Oh sure, yeah. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, so I'm a uh, endurance coach. Um, I obviously focus primarily on trail runners, but I definitely coach people for, um, road objectives as well. Um, and it's really cool. I, I feel like we're also lucky here. We are Tina, like doing this podcast, um, many hundreds of miles apart, like Mm -hmm. here on the internet. And so, yeah, I, the, the primary way I coach is, um, online. And so I am able to, um, create a schedule for people online and, um, have weekly office hours so I can talk to my athletes, um, with video calls, which is very nice, but it's so cool to get to work with athletes. I work with athletes, um, all over the world. And so it's actually been really cool as a fan of the sport and a passionate trail runner myself to just see all these different places that people train. Like I have athletes in India, Scotland, the UK, obviously America and and Canada, but yeah, it's just, it's really freaking cool to see people in like rural India, like getting after it on Strava, you know, and it's like, we all have this kind of like similar, um, experience when we're on the trails. And I think it really, um, I, I already think that like we are as people a lot more similar than we are different. And so it's just been really cool, like to get to interact with all of these athletes and see them interact with each other, um, on our Facebook group and stuff. That's just like, even though we're living in different parts of the world and have different experiences, like, you know, we all lace up our shoes the same way and run the same trails and suffer on the uphills in the same way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Why is it that hills never get any easier? They never get any easier. You know, (laughs) that's not going to (laughs) change. Well, yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's one of the lessons that we should have for, uh, new runners. Uh, it's just one of the one, the key ones that doesn't get mentioned, but should be, is just like, Hey Hills, they're always going to be hard. It doesn't matter how fit you get. Um, Adam, where can people go find you, um, and tell them your website if they want to go, yeah, learn more about your coaching, assuming you have some spaces. Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's, um, so my coaching website is runmary.com. It's a play on my last name, which is M E R. Yeah. Thanks. And, uh, my, uh, yeah, if you, I'm on Instagram and Strava primarily. And if you type in my name, Adam Mary, um, I come right up Mm -hmm. and, uh, I might be making myself look silly here, but Mary in England, that means like jolly happy, right? Yes, exactly. Same here. Okay. Same here. That was the play, right? Yeah. That's the play. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's a nice uh, last name to have, especially around the Christmas holiday, but yeah, joyful, cheery. Well, actually, my um, my mum's maiden name is Jolly, so really? I know that. <laughs> yeah. So you were Tina Jolly? No, no, no. My mum, no, my mum's maiden name. Yeah, that's but I have cool a lot of Jollies. Name. My family are the Jollies. Wow. So, um, they, that's wow. a pretty cool name at Christmas as well. So um, we're kind of kin of sorts, Mary and yes, Jolly. Yes, there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, but thank you so much for joining me today. And um, I appreciate you um, and all that you're doing for the community. I absolutely see why Ryan and Win adore you. And um, oh. yeah, just thank you. And I look forward to hopefully crossing paths someday in the future. Thank you. Yes, Tina, good luck at Bryce. Thanks again thank for the opportunity. And thanks for what you're doing for the community too. I can't wait to see what you do on the trails and uh, check out your new book too. Hi friends, just a quick message to say a big thank you to the Running For Real team. While I may be the face of Running For Real and the voice behind the podcast, there are a group of people who are working tirelessly to provide everything that runners could need within our community to make our community stronger, better, and evolve and grow and learn from one another. We are working really hard to make Running For Real the place we believe it can be within our community. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone on our team. That is Victoria, Stacy, Sandy, Sally, Maria, Kelsey, Kat, Jeremy, and Erica. I appreciate each and every one of you and the hard work that you put in. Now let's get back to the show. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I loved that guy. I mean, I knew from following him for a while since Patty and um, Ryan said something or Wynn and Ryan said something that he was someone really cool but he just that was really special I really appreciated that conversation I'm so excited to see what he does in the future and I'm just thankful and grateful for that time with him um I really this was another good example of where I just feel so thankful for the opportunity to do this what a gift I am so I mean to get to meet amazing people like Adam it's just really special so thank you for being a supporter of this podcast it means a lot on that note I would like to also thank our sponsors for this episode you can get 25% off at Inside Tracker to go get your insides check to see how everything is doing with you as we are going into racing season by going to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina that will get you 25% off I also want to encourage you to go check out the All Birds website to ch check out the Dasher 2 that I was talking about earlier in the episode. And also, if you sign up for that Boulder race at boulderthon.org, you can get $20 off the half marathon or full marathon by using that deal. I will put links to everything in the show notes at runningforreal.com forward slash episode 293. And you can also find the links wherever you are listening to this right now. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you on Monday for a together run. And actually next week we are beginning our running reunions season uh, series on Wednesday. So come join us for that. It's going to be really fun. See you then.